Thank you for attending this presentation about the development of an open source, open hardware, software defined radio platform for two way satellite time frequency transfer. This presentation is shared with you by myself, Jean Michel Fried, with the work of my colleague at FEM2SC Time and Frequency, Besançon East of France, with uh, Besançon Observatory, with the uh, Seattle Paris Observatory Center of France, and with the support of Claudio Caloso from INRIM. You can find the repository of all the work here if you wish to reproduce this uh, development that aims at sharing information between two observatories located about 400 kilometers apart using the Telstar 11N uh, geostationary satellite currently used for two-way time transfer between Europe and North America. So the objective is to contribute uh, in the development of coordinated universal time, UTC, by uh, providing means for comparing clocks uh, in complement to current optical fiber or uh, common view GNSS measurements. So in this case, we wish to send information from one observatory to a geostationary satellite which will broadcast the information back towards Europe or North America. And because of a slow pace of light, this link will take something like 260 milliseconds to go from ground to satellite to ground. And so the classical approach for cancelling this delay is a two-way time transfer where both observatories are sending the same information at the same time to the satellite and uh, will be able to cancel the time of flight by comparing their measurements. Now, because of our past activity on developing a software-defined radio radar and using pseudo-random spreading, spect uh, spectrum spreading using pseudo-random sequences, we should be able to tackle the challenge uh, quite easily. Well, actually, the challenge that will be discussed throughout these slides is that the satellite is actually not fixed in space, but is subject to various gravitational forces, including the moon and the sun. And due to the motion of the satellite reaching the targeted state of the art of a time tech satra modem of sub 200 picosecond accuracy and stability will require uh, uh, dedicated processing. So what is the uh, approach? Well, the allocated bandwidth is defined by the bandwidth of the rented channel on Telstar, and this will drive the data rate of about 2.5 megachips per second. We will generate the 70 megahertz intermediate frequency from the FPGA, as well as the pseudo-random sequence uh, resulting from linear feedback shift register whose taps match the maximum length sequence of the Galois field code as documented, for example, on this uh, website where you will find the right tap location to have maximum length. So here is an example of a measurement, a ranging measurement, in which we compare the Satra modem from TimeTech with our SDR implementation of a one second long code, one second being selected to avoid any uh, uh, uncertainty on the time of flight and a pulse repetition interval longer than the time of flight. And what we do see beyond the excellent match between SATR and our own software-defined radio is that the satellite is moving by plus or minus 75 microseconds with a daily fluctuation or about 45 kilometers, which is the definition of a geostationary orbit. So what we will need is to cancel this uh, plus or minus 75 microseconds per day or 5 nanoseconds per second satellite motion. And so the architecture that we uh, consider is the uh, input from the meteorological source, the 1 PPS and 10 megahertz meteorological source. A uh, field programmable gate array will generate with high uh, timing uh, reproducibility the pseudo-random sequence generation as well as the 10 megahertz binary phase shift keying intermediate frequency that will be filtered using a surface acoustic wave uh, bandpass filter to only keep the fundamental mode and get rid of the harmonics of the general purpose input Output, output square wave output over here. The sine wave will be up converted to be transmitted towards the satellite on the 14 gigahertz uplink, and the 11 gigahertz downlink will be fed back uh, to the software fan radio receiver. Now, the mandatory requirement of all this work is to have coherent two channel software defined radio receiver in order to have, on the one hand, a recording of a local time as generated by the pseudo random sequence over here, and the downlink that has been recorded from a remote end, either for ranging if it's our own signal or for two-way time transfer if it's the over speaker signal. In this coherent analysis, the local clock will be cancelled, but nevertheless, we shall focus in the beginning with a meteorological clock for feeding the uh, software fan radio receiver and avoid any uncertainty from the clock during the cancellation of the 
uh, common mode. So in this case, we have only an FPGA for transmitter, software defined radio receiver, and all parameters are software defined for post-processing using a computer using asynchronous communication over Ethernet or USB. Now, the first question we might wonder is how to select the code length. Uh, the Sartre is using a 4 millisecond code length. Uh, in this case, we started working with 1 second code length. And the question uh, arises from the signal-to-noise ratio gain from the correlation. Now, if we use a match filter approach where we do a measurement on one uh, channel and a measurement on the other channel, then the product of these two voltages will be a power and the improvement uh, rises as and the duration of a code that is transmitted. However, in this case, we have a perfect copy of a transmitted uh, code and we have a received signal, noisy signal, and in this case, the correlation only improves as square root as on, of the code length. Now, if on the one hand we have a long code, we will improve a signal to noise ratio, but over one second we have fewer me estimates measurements. On the other hand, if we take a shorter code, we have more estimates over one second, and the poor signal to noise ratio will be compensated for by the averaging. So at the end, these two quantities cancel, and we have validated experimentally that depending on the code length, as indicated on the upper right uh, legend, from 10,000 up to uh, uh, 2.5 million code length, one second code length, over one second integration duration, the standard deviation remains 200 picosecond independently of the code length. So selecting the code length is not a matter of signal to noise ratio, but will be uh, defined by other, driven by other consideration. How can we actually try to reach a 200 picosecond accuracy when sampling a 5 mega, a five mega sample per second or 200 nanosecond sampling period? Well, the requirement is to use oversampling or super resolution of a correlation by using a parabolic fit between the correlation maximum and the two neighbors, the point on the left and the point on the right, in order to have a high resolution estimate of the time of flight. So here what you do see is the motion of a satellite at a rate of 3 nanosecond per second when this measurement was performed. But if we remove the linear drift of a satellite, we do end up with fluctuations of the time of flight, the time delay by plus or minus 5 nanosecond, well above the targeted 200 picosecond. The reason for this fluctuation is the inaccuracy of a parabolic fit, and what we actually must do is uh, first perform the sync uh, cardinal assigned analysis prior to the uh, parabolic fit, and this is achieved by oversampling. So in this example here, the red line is obtained by oversampling by a factor of three, and here these random fluctuations are cancelled thanks to this preliminary oversampling prior to uh, parabola fit. So the challenge here is that under the best conditions, the correlation peak is right at the sampling period and the signal to noise ratio is optimal, providing the best uh, correction. But in the worst case scenario, we have two measurements uh, on, uh, uh, at the same level, so a poor signal to noise ratio, and the third measurement is very far away with a very weak signal. And this is the worst condition. So what you do see on this chart here is the blue curve is the correlation peak maximum, red and orange are the two neighbors uh, evolving as the signal is sweeping uh, uh, over the, uh, as the correlation is sweeping over the sampling periods. And the challenge is to compensate for the inaccuracies of this position of a correlation peak over the sampling points. So what we actually end up doing, following the convolution theorem that says that the product of a convolution is actually the uh, product of a Fourier transforms, and considering that uh, the time is flipped between a convolution and a correlation, we end up doing the correlation in the Fourier domain as the product of a signal times a complex conjugate of the uh, uh, for a transform of a code. And in practice, what we end up doing uh, after sampling the IQ stream is to first have a coarse estimate of a frequency offset by squaring the signal, getting rid of the BPSK modulation. This coarse frequency is compensated for so that the correlation uh, accumulates energy. The correlation is performed in the Fourier domain. And we actually benefit from this intermediate step in the Fourier domain for interpolating by zero padding prior to inverse Fourier transform. And this will be our optimal uh, interpolation. Once the maximum of the argument of a correlation is calculated, we perform the parabolic fit, and because we did the same interpolation on the raw data, we can actually match the code position with the data and calculate the signal-to-noise ratio uh, in addition to storing the uh, parabola fit of a correlation peak. <laughs> 
So the question is, that what is the impact of the frequency offset uh, calculation? And actually, what we do see here is that uh, over uh, multiple days, the frequency of the downlink from Telstar is fluctuating by a few hundred hertz. And what is the impact of the frequency fluctuation? What we actually do see with the simulation, this is in terms of sampling period. So if we say that the period is 200 nanoseconds, then 10 to the minus 6 sampling period will be a few few tens of picoseconds and what we end up having is a very minor impact of a frequency uh, inaccuracy on the correlation peak position until the frequency offset is so poor that the energy does not accumulate and the signal to noise ratio has been so much degraded that the analysis is no longer possible. So uh, the frequency accuracy needs to be much better than the uh, inverse of the code duration, but as long as this condition is matched, the impact on the correlation peak position will be minor. So once this uh, estimate has been performed, we do have the time of flight on the both ends. And the challenge now relies on uh, comparing the two-way time transfer analysis. Because the satellite is moving by uh, 70 microseconds per day or 5 nanoseconds per second, if we make an error in the two-way time transfer analysis by one second, we end up having fluctuations, daily fluctuations of plus or minus 5 nanoseconds or even 10 nanoseconds if we make an, an error of two seconds when comparing uh, the acquisition at both ends. So what the uh, solution for this is to introduce, in addition to the pseudo-random sequence that has been generated, a marker for the beginning of a second. And in this case, what we do is we flip the first pseudo-random sequence as classical don classically done in a CDMA communication so that the correlation peak is flipped for the first second and will be of the right sign for the others. And by uh, having this 2XOR on the frequency carrier, we end up introducing a marker for the beginning of a second. And this marker is extracted during the post-processing by analyzing the course phase offset due to the motion of a satellite as the phase of a squared signal or the argument of a correlation uh, and by subtracting the uh, half of the argument of a square signal, we end up keeping only the BPSK uh, binary information at the end of a calculation. So the challenge now is to be able to align the recording that have been performed on both ends. These two locations are several hundred kilometers away and we assume that both computers are NTP synchronized so that they start their acquisition sequence at the same time. However, the software defined radio takes a random amount of time to start on one end with respect to the other end. Or the only thing we make sure of is that broadcasting the code is started late enough that the recording of the software defined radio has started at both ends. So what we end up receiving is these records on both ends that start at the beginning of the software defined radio measurement with the beginning of the code that has been transmitted on one end, the beginning of the code transmitted on the other hand, and we must make sure that we align accurately these measurements when we perform the two-way time transfer uh, calculation of the remote measurement minus the loopback on the local on one end minus the remote measurement minus the loopback measurement on the other end. So this will be our two-way time transfer calculation. Now, what we actually end up having is a code that is running on the received signal, a code that is running on the local copy, and the correlation peaks that are at the given location. Now, when we do this calculation in the Fourier domain, the assumption is that the code is cyclic and we match the beginning and the end of a sequence. What you actually see here is over one second the fact that the code has not uh, been perfectly, uh, the frequency offset has not been perfectly compensated for, and the initial real part of a correlation does not match the real part of the final correlation over, uh, at the right end. And so this is the cause for this correlation peak drop, the very last correlation peak, uh, decay is the indication that the cyclicity condition is not met. And this will be solved by aligning the code as advertised by our colleague Claudio Caloso. Furthermore, this is opportunity to also insist on plotting the real part of the correlation and not the magnitude. It will hardly impact the shape of a correlation, but it will emphasize the fact that we are misaligned if the frequency correlation is not properly corrected for. 
So once we go from these equations to the implementation where we take the Fourier transform of a received signal after uh, a course uh, frequency offset correction, we perform the zero padding for interpolation and uh, go back into the time domain for uh, uh, achieving the correlation. We do the same calculation on the raw data to calculate the signal to noise ratio. Here you can see the evolution of uh, received power as measured by a power probe at the focal point of the Paris Observatory parabola dish with respect to our own power estimation and you do see that the uh, match is uh, excellent uh, proving that this calculation of a signal to noise ratio and received power is working. Actually during this set of measurements the transmitted power dropped for a few hours by 10 dB due to a uh, uh, experimental error and you do see both on the power probe as well as on the measurement this drop by 10 dB. The implementation of this software is available on the uh, GitHub repository. So we can demonstrate this calculation on real-time analysis uh, using new radio and it is in this demonstration the correlation is performed by multiplying the Fourier transform of the recorded data collected by the software defined radio and multiplying by the complex conjugate of the local code that is being run from a file recording this data. Once the two Fourier transform have been calculated, we multiply conjugate and take the inverse Fourier transform to get back into the time domain. When no signal is being broadcast, no correlation peak is visible on the top chart and the phase is random. Once the signal is being broadcast, these correlation peaks are visible after the correlation and this is the uh, fluctuation of the phase due to the uh, mismatch of the frequency uh, compensation. And this correlation peak can be seen to be slowly shifting if the two uh, local oscillators are not common. If we switch to a common local oscillator, then the two uh, clocks are running at the same rate and the correlation peak will stop. If we zoom in the phase over here, we do see the frequency uh, offset uh, prior to the costas loop that compensate for the frequency difference and we see the pi phase jumps related to the BPSK modulation. So this is actually our simulator where you can see on the left the FPGA running the code and on the right the B210 software defined radio with the loopback signal and the recording signal both uh, allowing for uh, the differential analysis. So as a conclusion to this demonstration, we have performed multiple uh, measurements between Paris Observatory and Besançon Observatory. We do reach a standard deviation in the sub 200 picosecond range as uh, uh, aimed. We do have signal to noise ratio that are consistent with such uh, transfer requirements. If we convert this into C over N, uh, N0, we end up having a, a carrier to noise density of about uh, 50 dB Hertz, uh, which is consistent with uh, the such communication requirements. And we do have a uh, repository allowing to synthesize this uh, demonstrator for multiple platforms, including the E2 B210, the ATUS Reserves X310, or the uh, standalone FPGA uh, Ping Z2, which allows for very fast synthesis and prototyping. Now, at the moment, the resulting two way time transfer exhibits excessive fluctuations from one session to another, despite the excellent, uh, to no, uh, excellent uh, fluctuation within each session. The fluctuation from one session to the other is excessive. Uh, this requires either to transfer the time and date in the digital message or or to make sure that we actually match the transfer date between uh, the analysis of the two ends. Um, the question of the code length is still being investigated and the alignment of the two data rate.
This work is supported by First TF and the French uh, National uh, Laboratoire National d'Essai and by your taxpayers' money. And with this conclusion, I thank you for your attention. Further presentation can be found on our YouTube channel, it's including the tutorial on how to synthesize the Amaranth code. Thank you.